401k advisors want to build a scalable practice, but aren't always sure what to do next. Welcome to Outcomes, the podcast designed to help advisors think, make decisions, and cast a vision to create a business for the future. Here's your host, Ross Marino, financial planner, author, speaker, and CEO of Advisor2x. Welcome to Outcomes, the podcast. Today, I am joined by Matt Daniels, Director of Retirement Plans, Wilshire Benefits Group. Good morning, Matt. Hey, good morning, Ross. How are you? I am good. Good to see you by Zoom. I know you're doing a lot of Zoom and a lot of video with your clients. And when we first spoke, you mentioned that you really dove into video quickly. And not only did you dive in, but it worked really well for you. Why do you think it works so well? It just, it takes down so many of the natural barriers. You know, that first meeting or even that last sales meeting with with a prospective client, you're, you're almost on opposite sides of the table from each other, not adversarial, but feeling each other out. There's always this dance that goes on. And I think this leveled the playing field in a lot of different respects. Um, the first one is we're all in it together. I mean, from a, a first time sales call to a seasoned vet, you're figuring this out kind of at the same pace. It, does the mic work? Is the lighting right? Um, can they see the top of my head? You know, what's in the background? Do I have a dog run through? And it, what it caused initially was just a kind of a breath, a sigh of relief. Okay, we're, we're all going to have these little mix ups and hiccups. Let's work through them together. You know, it almost caused you to laugh at yourself a little bit because, you know, how many stories of somebody walking through the back of the screen not knowing we were on a video chat, whether they were, you know, in a towel or, you know, I had one where uh, somebody stood up and they had shorts on the bottom and business up top just because they didn't think about it and they had to stand up for something. And, and those things happen and it just causes everybody to relax a little bit. And it takes that that natural, you know, I still use the word adversarial, but that, that natural dance out of it where we're, we're feeling each other out. We're just on the same team, having a conversation, trying to figure something out um, or figure out if, and that could be, do we work together? Do we like each other? Can we help solve your problem? Do you even have a problem? But it cut through a lot of that red tape. And then we, we really embraced it because we didn't have to travel. And this became the medium. This was acceptable where, you know, a year ago, to do a Zoom call was, well, geez, you don't really care about seeing us. Is Are we not important enough to make the drive? Now, this is just how we have to do it. So we all embraced it. We all got our arms around it. And a sales call or a service call goes from being a half a day exercise because you got to prep the material, you got to print it, you've got to get in a car, you've got to drive there, conduct the meeting and then come back. Now, most of the material is electronic. We pop it up on the screen. We maybe prep a half hour or so before the meeting do the meeting and then we're done. And we're now being able to hold four or five and six meetings a day where maybe before we can only do two or three. So the efficiency side of it really went through the roof for us and allowed us to service where the service was needed because you know we'll talk about our book of business in a little bit, but we had a lot of folks, what should we do? We need to talk to you, we need to see you. Um, And had we had to do that all in person, so remove this piece of it, I don't think we would have been able to keep up with the prospecting efforts and really driving new business because we just wouldn't have had time. It would have been all spent on the service work. So this medium allowed us to meet the needs of our current clients, but really dive into getting a conversation set up with new prospects and new people that may want to use our services. I definitely noticed that my perception of what is professional has changed because when we're in the house, the dog's going to bark. And a year ago, I may have cared. Today, it's the dog barking. Nobody cares. So it certainly shifted what we consider professional. We've had to redo kind of our or remake our definition of that. But then also, when you shift what is professional, I think by default, it just becomes more personal and more engaging. And then I think we're able to connect so much better. And do you feel that connection now that you're Zooming with people? I do. Um, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day and there was this, this connection void for a long time, um, where we just, we couldn't go anywhere for a lot of us. We were at home, we had our families, which was great. So we got to have that connection, but that outside connection, um, I'm a guy who typically, if I go to the grocery store, I get what I need. I'm, I'm pleasant. Say hello to the, the folks in line. Um, how's your day? But now I found, I found myself having conversations with these people. You know, we're talking about what's going on. Who are you? What is this? Just because that, that, that void was there. Uh, for a good two or three months before everybody adopted this. So I think, yeah, the walls came down, but the want to connect was also there as well. There's almost this craving for, I need to see somebody's face. I need to, you know, I can't just have a phone call. I'm, we're having a phone call essentially, but I can see you. There, there's this inherent draw to that, um, 
mean, we're, we're creatures of a, a tribe and we all want to be together and get together. And, and this allowed for that. And I think that's a lot of the success folks have had of is because of that. Let's talk about your practice. You have a similar practice to some people, but it's certainly different than a lot of advisors and a lot of firms out there. Can you talk about how your practice is set up? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, I would call it overarching, an employee benefits practice. So the the majority of our firm and uh, the folks there are dedicated towards uh, health and welfare benefits. So your medical insurance, vision, dental, long-term disability, um, anything that would come as your normal workplace benefits. Uh, and that side of our house makes up about 330 different entities, different clients. Um, but there was this natural draw to, well, can you also help with this? Can you also help with a 401k? You were starting to change the narrative of them being two separate things and being part of a total comprehensive benefits package. Um, so this allows for a lot of back and forth and synergy between what I would say are my clients or the retirement plan clients versus the employee benefits clients. They're just our clients now. And we're able to bring a, a set of solutions that cut down the, the, the one choke the th- or throat to choke We can get in and talk to them. We have one point of contact, or maybe there's two of us at the office, but we're managing the overall relationship. And that's driving my conversations with the folks on the employee benefits side is how are we helping them? So I know more about employee benefits than I ever thought I would getting into this industry. I know more about health insurance than I thought I should, but it helps me have that conversation with current clients, but it's also a really neat prospecting tool um, as I'm talking to my 401k only folks well, when's your renewal? What's happening with this? Would you like to talk to somebody else on our team? And I'm able to make these introductions in, in a much less uh, intrusive way than, you know, you need to move over here. You need to do this type of thing. Um, it really allows us to be a consultant rather than uh, a salesperson, you know, and 20 years ago, I never thought I'd get into sales. I wanted to be an analyst. I was going to sit behind a desk and crunch numbers and spin them out. And somebody else got to go deal with that. But then I realized I really like talking to people. And if you can think of it as solving a problem rather than um, selling somebody something, it changes the whole dynamic of it. And our firm allows for that because we have total ownership of the relationship. And it's a good driver for success because we're constantly helping them level up their benefits package in different areas. And because of that, you know, we've talked about the referral piece. Referrals come pretty easy you know, hey, we're, we're doing this overall package versus we've got this guy for this and this gal for that. Um, it just makes it for an easier user experience. And I think in this age of overworked, um, undertimed, people like that. People like being able to have one space to go, you know, give me the easy button to some degree. And uh, we gravitate towards that. We definitely view simple in our minds as fewer steps. So it's often related to this is too complex, but it's not really the complexity. It's really more about the steps. So we love that one-stop shopping in certain situations because it helps us get it done quicker. In the 401k world, it is technical and it's a challenge for many people to be a jack of all trades and say, oh, I do 401ks and this and that. And that's why the specialists in most cases dominate the markets that they're in because you need to be a specialist. But as you do it over the years, you start gathering this ancillary knowledge that your clients are dealing with. And the more you understand that, obviously, the better it's going to be. And that's the advantage of being in a benefit shop. I'm not in a benefit shop. I'm from the financial planning world. So I can have those kind of conversations. But when you're from a benefits place and you're able to integrate that, it really does take it to another level where you understand the prospect or the client you're talking to. And they know that you understand them. And really, that's probably the most important factor out there as does this advisor get me? Do they know what I'm dealing with? Do they understand my problems? And I think that works really well. From your end, you mentioned that you were being more intentional about who you're going to work with. And I know your practice has been growing, but you have a definition on intentional and who you want to work with. Can you explain how you go through that? As with any business, when you're starting out, it's we've got to make enough to eat. We've got to get enough revenue coming through the door. And I think we're all probably guilty of at some point taking on a client that was going to drive revenue, but we knew it was going to, from the beginning, man, this is going to be a lot of work. They're going to be a headache to work with this. Ugh, I'm making a decision based on profitability. And fortunately, we're at a position where money comes through the door. So we're okay in that perspective. But now we get to be really intentional about who we work with. And I look at it in two veins. The one is, are they going to be fun? You know, can we find a fun client? You know, is it a, a local craft brewery that, geez, these guys are just neat. I like their story. Um, a recent one is we took over a, a 
retirement plan for a chain of uh, gyms in the area. They're just, they're just a neat group of people. You know, I've got a two person doctor's practice and uh, about an hour away from me. They will never be a real profitable client. But they're a blast. I love talking to them when they pit, when they're calling. I know it's going to be a fun conversation. So if they, can they be fun? That's number one. If they are, let's do business together. And the other one is, can we make a difference? Can I get somebody? Can I help the employees? You know, is the is the ownership group looking at this plan not as a I have to have this benefit because it's just the cost of doing business, but we want to have this benefit. We want to have a robust four hundred one k plan. We don't just want we don't want to have a popular one, but we want to have a successful one. We want to get people to a meaningful retirement. And if I can get the buy-in from the, the employer group or the, the plan sponsor for that, again, that's a plan we're going to take on because we know we're going to make a difference in somebody's life and hopefully a lot of people's lives by helping manage that plan. I remember going through a mental exercise years ago of which clients do I want to take on, but also which clients do I want to transition away, which sure. we use the word transition because I remember being told by compliance, I can't say I fired them. <laughs> And, and I thought that was great advice. So when we transition clients away, mm-hmm. and I remember thinking, I don't want any cringe clients. Yep. Because if I hear this client is on the phone, I don't want to do the, uh, because if I cringe, there's, there's no amount of money. That's why we joke no. around here. This is the no stress zone. We don't do stress. We don't want to do things that are going to, going to create tension or stress. We want to enjoy. We want to have fun. We want to enjoy the work that we're doing. So you, you have to transition cringe clients away. And it sounds like you're trying to figure out that balance as you go. And, and that's great because I think that's the way you build a practice where you enjoy coming in on Monday morning and you don't feel like Friday afternoon, oh, man, I am so glad this is over because this week is just too many cringers out there. You just don't want to get there. But I know you like the education part, too, and you like to help people save and get them comfortable with it. What do you think is the secret sauce to getting people to save for retirement? I think it's removing the, the stigma and the barriers and the roadblocks that whether they've put them there, society's put them there. Um, I started my career doing employee education. Uh, on the 401k side. So she's 15, 16 years ago, where I was eyeball to eyeball with uh, doctors and lawyer groups to uh, guys working on the shop floor. You know, I remember one of my first education meetings, there was no place for my projector. You know, this was before you could just plug into the TV. There was no clear wall. So I was taking, you know, sheets of paper like this and taping them up on the lockers to bake some type of screen because I, you know, it was at a point in my life doing it where I had to have the crutch of the presentation. I couldn't just talk about it. Now there was no screen. I just get up there and talk, but we put so many barriers at that time, you know, 401ks were turned into a 201k. So if you go back to 2008, it was, is a common, and that mentally sits with people. If I put money in, I might lose. And if I lose, then I'm in trouble. And, but if I don't put money in, then I can't lose. So by default, I did okay. Right. So it's just sort of this misguided thing. So it's re- helping remove that and talk, you know, you talk with folks, um, I'm going to start saving when, when the, the car's paid off, when the kids go to school, once I get this, then, and so many people live in that mindset that when you do that, when do you ever get there? Cause there's always another roadblock. There's always another thing that's going to pr- preclude you from doing it. So my job when I educate is to try and remove as much of that as possible. So remove the investment fear. Right? Not that we pick and choose investments for individuals, we don't, but when we design a plan, we really try and come up with a, a good, robust lineup that whether you're a do-it-yourselfer or you're a do-it-for-me folk you know, using a, a target date fund, that we make it easy. Always I'll get one hand go up in a meeting. Well, if I do the target date fund, I kind of don't feel like I'm doing my job. Right? Like I'm not taking enough active interest in this and geez, by golly, I want to be involved. And I tell people, I've got a degree in investment finance, uh, a couple of licenses and designations behind my name that tell me I kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, I use target date funds because I don't want right. to manage it every day. There's people sitting behind a desk that are much brighter than I'm ever going to hope to be um, managing this glide path. And the investment, as most of you listening will know, makes up what, depending on the stat you read, between 25 and 15% of ultimate portfolio success, the rest is the savings piece. You know, I could have the, the, the lights out investment in the world, but if I'm only saving 1% of my income, I'm still never getting to retirement. Like that just doesn't happen. So we really try and remove the stigma of the investment. You don't have to be a portfolio manager. Just have a little bit of faith and have a nice, well-balanced, diversified portfolio, whether you let a, a manager do that for you in the form of a target date fund or even a managed account, um, or whether you pick and choose your own, make sure you got all the boxes covered. And then we pivot really to, let's talk about savings. Let's talk about getting you to a point where you're comfortable saving. Because 
again, that mental side says, well, if I'm not saving two or $300 a paycheck, what's the point? Well, let's talk about starting slow. You know, let's talk about, in my presentation, I always give a, a, a 1% number. Okay, if you are making $40,000 a year, saving 1%, it's roughly $5 a week out of your paycheck. And you see kind of eyes, well, I can do $5 right? Um, we can do that. Well, what would we, what would 5% be? And if we just do the math for them and kind of show them what it'd be, oh, well, yeah, I can do that. that. That's palatable. That's, that's digestible. And if we get them thinking that it doesn't have to be this mountain you have to climb, but rather these series of small strategic steps to get you to the goal, um, it, again, it, it takes away a lot of those roadblocks. Yes, I can do this. So we want them to go from, I'm not sure if I can to, yes, I can. And how do I do more? You know, and with a lot of our plans, we talk about auto enroll and auto escalate and putting those features. And I think those auto features really go a long way to driving long term success. But that first barrier is removing the concern, removing the worry. And the more effectively we can do that, the more successful the plan becomes because we're getting people to meaningful outcomes rather than just, yeah, I've got this plan here with a couple hundred dollars in it. And I saved in it for a while, but then the market went down. I want folks to not even think about it. This is just something automatic that we do. And the more we can create that, the better I think. How many other people out there still think they understand when to get in and out of the markets and they still do it? When we're trying to educate them that you, you buy, you invest for the future, and it's still a challenge. And I think one of the big challenges is what you mentioned, it's up front, it's getting in. And once they get in, it certainly gets a little easier. But then, of course, once they start moving money in and out, it, it can be challenging. And for many people, I get it. It's terrifying. You, know, you don't go to cash because you you just had nothing else better to do. Well, I don't know. I think I'll just put half my money into cash because I didn't know what, what else to do tonight. I was bored. It, right. There's a strong driver there. People are, are certainly nervous and they're making these kind of moves out there. And it's our job to help them see the long term and help them stay invested. You have a lot of 321. Mm -hmm. You have some 338. You have a way of talking about each service and you're predominantly 321. Can you talk about how you explain that to plan sponsors, how they respond to it and why in your situation, it seems like they pick 321 a lot more than 338? Really for me, the conversation I have is it comes down to trigger control. Who wants to be in charge of the investment? So I think most plan sponsors and advisors will agree that you have to have a prudent process for how you evaluate the investments. Um, whether that's a proprietary system where you, you're just doing the fact checking on it for you and you're being the expert, or you're outsourcing it to somebody like a Mesero or you know, there's another Wilshire out there or Iron Financial and running it through their system. So you need to have a prudent process as a fiduciary. I think that that's, that's without a doubt. Um, but I like the idea of having some of those safeguards around it of the 321. Okay, we're, we're condensing this universe of mutual funds down to something manageable. So the, this manageable group of funds that there's going to be some fiduciary protection along with selecting from this lineup. If I eat off of this menu, I, I'm relatively okay. And I know I'm simplifying that a little bit, but I'm relatively okay as long as we, we eat off this menu. Um, and then I talk about, okay, now we've created the menu. Do you want to be told what you have to eat on it? Well, what do you mean? Well, do you want somebody else saying you're going to get these five off this menu? Or do you want to have some control over that? And some say, well, gee, just make it easy for me. I want, tell me what to eat and I'm going to eat it and I'm okay. So that's the 338 side of it. There's somebody ultimately saying, here's what you get. Um, and when we walk through it like that, and, and maybe it's leading, I don't know. I, until now, I've never thought of it that way. But it, most of my plan sponsors want to have some say so in it. They want to be directed. They want to have guidance, but ultimately they want to be involved still. So again, they don't want to be portfolio managers picking and choosing the funds, but they want to feel like they have some say-so in how it gets done. When we start walking through it, again, most of those conversations are ABC fund has fallen out of favor. We need to replace it uh, where our suggestion is X, Y, Z. I think I've had one plan sponsor say, well, did we look at anything else? Or did we, and of course we did, but he said, do we look at this fund? I said, well, that wasn't one of the ones we considered, but let's run it through the screener and see. You know, and it was kind of apples to apples. They said, well, if all things being equal, I'd rather have that one than the one you suggested. Okay, you know, that's fine. Uh, but he wanted that involvement in it. Um, again, I think of, of our book of business, we probably have two plans that are a full 338. And, and a big part of that is... Um, the, the record keeper they're with, that becomes more of their shtick and part of their service is acting as that 338. So they do a little bit more there. I, I don't believe I've had anybody outside of that opt in for, yes, please give me the 338. They all want some amount of control. And again, we talked early on about the CEO type. A lot of them don't like to relinquish that control. Even if they are going to ultimately under the surface, farm it out to us in the 321, um, 
they want to feel like they still have a hand in that. And I understand that. Yeah, and that is a CEO type. And as soon as you said that, I, I had to keep myself from chuckling. I thought, well, I'm a CEO type that doesn't want to do any of that. I, I want to outsource everything. I, <laughs> right. I want to use my mental capacity and my bandwidth to do things that I think I'm supposed to put my energy into, not try to figure out an investment sure. in you. Right. But there, there's different personalities out there. How about a shout out to a vendor, someone at a vendor that's doing good work and has really helped you build your business? Yeah. And I've got three and they're, they're quick. So um, so that we've got a team at ADP, Alan Goldstein and Trisha Umpenbach, um, that have just been fantastic since I made the move over uh, in terms of just product knowledge, industry knowledge, sharing back and forth. Ted McDermott at Principal. Uh, I've known Ted for 15 years uh, coming up in the business. I started working with him at Principal doing education. And now we're, we're peers working together on the plan side of it. And then Brian Fernaris with Securian. I've known Brian for about a decade and look at him as a mentor in the business. Um, I would say from a knowledge standpoint, if I have something weird, he's who I call. I mean, he knows he's forgot more about the 401k or the, the qualified plan industry than I'll ever know. And just having people like that in your corner, um, people that know the business and know you is really invaluable. You know, everybody can have the next shiny object, but if you don't have some substance behind it, um, you know, it's tough to make it on your own. You know, you need to have resources because as smart as I like to think I am at times, um, I get the question like, Geez, I just don't know the answer to that, but I got a guy who does, you know, and I usually have somebody I can call uh, between the four of them that, that really knows the answer and helps get me where we need to be. 316s are becoming more popular. People are talking about them. People are adding them to their plans. Do you have any concerns about that? You know, my only concern there is the long-term cost of it, right? So I, I think the, we have a few that we work with a, on a couple large cases uh, where we have multiple payroll streams feeding in and we're really needing to pull a 316 in to, to wrangle all of that. But the cost of the insurance that the 316 is paying it continued to be, to be going up. Um, and this is only anecdotal. So I'm not a 316 and don't have to carry the insurance. But some of the ones we work with, the constant conversation is, yeah, our premiums went up again. And because of that, that drives the cost up to the participant. Now, the argument could be made that maybe the insurance has been underpriced for a while and it's finding its level as to, okay, how much risk are we really assuming um, doing these activities? You know, what type of, you know, litigation's coming because of that? And I think we're seeing in this market that there's only increased litigation. There's not decreased at this point. So I can, I see that insurance piece keep going up. So the cost of it's going to go up. And the only thing I don't like about that is, I mean, everything needs to be fairly priced, but you may have people who really need a 316 shying away from it because the cost becomes prohibitive. And that, that's what I would hate to see because there are folks out there, plan sponsors who really need that service that are going to look at it as a line item and say, eh, I think I can do it on my own. And whatever you're going to do, I think I can do it on my own. Not I know I can do it on my own. That, that's where mistakes happen and errors happen. And what would have been a yearly maybe line item cost that was a little tough to stomach becomes a, you know, a fine that, geez, we never thought we were going to have to deal with this. And now we've got this fine that, you know, that, that fee we were worried about pales in comparison. So I'm worried about the perception of it. Um, but we'll see. We'll see where that continues to go. Uh, but I do like the idea for the right, the right group that needs it. Uh, I think it's a fantastic service. We're recording this at the beginning, first quarter of 2021. You excited about this year? I am. Um, I think we're dealing with a lot of pent up demand um, from a lot of different perspectives. So we've kind of talked sales and service and, and I, my role there. I do both. I'm excited to start getting out and seeing people. And we've had a lot of clients now start to open the doors. Will you, you're willing to come out? You'll come out and meet with us? Yeah, heck yeah, we want you on site. Um, I've had a couple wholesalers stop in for the first time and they felt like it was their first day of school. They finally got to get out and see people again. Um, so I think there's a lot of demand for that. So I think this year we're doing a, a lot of plan reviews where we're going to get out. And it's not something that's going to be a checklist item for the plan sponsor anymore. They're looking forward to it. Not that reviewing a plan is a ton of excitement, but it's something new. Somebody's back in the office. Something's happened. So I'm really excited about that piece. And then from a growth perspective, um, I think the same thing. We had a lot of people this time last year, about a month from now, this time last year, breaks on everything, guys. We're just going to sit tight. We're not doing a thing for a little while here. 
And I think we'll talk about in a minute how I cracked through some of that. And we did actually get quite a bit of growth last year, but there's some other things took priority. We're doing PPP loans. We have different things we need to be worried about. We're worried about staff. Are we laying off? Can we hire? You know, Matt, benefits and 401k just need to take a backseat for a little bit. And I think that's now starting to open itself back up and folks are really open to conversation. So we're excited about the growth prospects as well as well this year, um, because I think it's going to be a good market for it. And you had a really big 2020 as well, though. We did 2020. Surprisingly, I remember thinking to myself back in March, man, what's this year going to look like? You know, because it was my second year. It's my second year with the firm. We had a decent first year, but I was kind of getting my feet under me, building my reputation inside our industry and inside our our local office there. Um, This was going to be my year, right? I was going to get out and really do it. How was this going to set us back? Was it going to set us back? And we were we've used the word intentional a couple of times. We really intentionally leaned into the, the struggle. Okay. We're going to get good at zoom meetings. We're going to get good at getting people on the phone because they don't have a lot else to do. You know, they're sitting at home, most of them. And once they've put out the fire that's in front of them, you know, provided there's not another one starting behind it, they've got time. They've got the capacity to have these conversations. So while I went into it thinking, I don't know if these people are going to be willing to take a call because they're going to be so bogged down by the things. I think once we got through March, the conversation started opening back up because folks found that the world's not ending. We're going to make it. It's a struggle. I mean, things are, you know, things are a struggle for a lot of people in different perspectives. Um, it's different, but we're going to be okay. And they were willing to have those conversations. So in 2020, we brought on 27 new plans, which was, was our best year ever in terms of a uh, number of clients to come in. And a lot of that came through, an introduction. Hey, somebody has a question. Will you sit down and talk to them? And my answer is always, yeah, I'll have a conversation with you whenever. What time works for you? 7 a.m.? Sure. 7 p.m.? Why not? You know, let's make it happen. And again, this medium allowed for that. I didn't have to be across town at 530 uh, dealing with rush hour. We pop onto this and, and let's have at it. So, um, so that was great. So let's go to the last question. Okay. It's always going to be the magic wand. Yep. So if I gave you a magic wand, you could change anything in the world, Matt. I've listened to the podcast quite a few times and I've thought about this question and, you know, I've always thought, okay, well, what would it be? Would it be something for me? I mean, I'm, I'm 5'11 and I've always wanted the dunk. Like, man, would I make myself be able to do that? No. <laughs> um, I think if I could change anything, it would be centered around education, not from the employee side or edu- but, you know, kids education. You know, I think, and I'll reference COVID, but it's not because of COVID. We really saw the gap between the availability to good education and it being tied to income and to where you live and the zip code you live in and the school district you live in, um, you know, down to, can you afford three laptops? Cause I've got three kids that need to be on a zoom call. No, we've got one, or we're doing it on s- somebody's smartphone. I would, I would love to find a way where we are able to educate everybody across the board. And there's always somebody in maybe a less advantageous area that breaks out. You know what, regardless of circumstance, the drive will always trump everything, in my opinion. If you've got the drive, you'll figure it out. But there's so many kids out there that maybe they have the drive, but just not enough to get over the hurdles that are placed in front of them. You know, you're, you're walking into a school building where you've got a leaking tile, but there's just not been, there's not the money to fix it. And how does that start your day? Or, you know, the only meal I'm going to get is at school that day. And now I'm doing things at home. I just, I think our education system from kind of the top down has a lot of work to do to to benefit all the kids the same. You know, that's the one thing. I wish we could equalize that so everybody starts out on the same foot when it comes to their their availability to be educated and educated well, um, feel good and safe in that environment and give them the opportunity to prosper. You know, there's probably stats and charts out there all over the place that, you know, if you have one parent that went to college, you're X likely to go to college. If you have two, you're X more likely. If you have none, you, you know, just those stats out there alone, you look and go, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. And yes, some kids will break out of it. Drive just going to push them to that. But so many kind of fall into the, that continuous cycle. And I think it sets folks up or sets kids up for um, a tougher road for some. And maybe that builds character. And you could probably spin that a lot of different ways. But if, if we could change anything and get this to where everybody has that same access to a good quality education, um, I think a lot of the things we talked about in this podcast in terms of the fear of savings and and the the trepidation and roadblocks come with that, uh, I think a lot of those things go away, right? I think think if everybody could have a a good baseline there just of being educated properly, um, you remove a lot of the problems we have in society now. So that would be my thing. If I could change anything, it would be centered around giving everybody uh, a great education. 
It's a great answer. And I think during the pandemic, it certainly highlights the wealth gap when it comes to education, because household income and net worth and education in most cases are correlated and For it's sure. positive, right? We certainly have more opportunities and it's been easy to see now where there are homes out there where you're right, they can't buy three computers. They may not even have a stable internet connection and we can go down the list. And maybe we knew this stuff before or heard it before, but now right. I think it's apparent to so many more people where, yeah, it's not just that we're able to give our kids an opportunity that others don't, which is a benefit. It's that some of the other kids out there, they're truly disadvantaged. And that shouldn't be that way in the education system. It should at least be a baseline of everybody gets this and it's good enough and it's enough of an opportunity to open doors. Um, right. And if you can improve, that's great. But uh, I, I think it's been exaggerated during the pandemic and, and hopefully there'll be some movement there. So what a great way to finish. Matt, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Ross, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure today. Thank you for listening to Outcomes. Subscribe now to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Advisor 2X. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.